So I'm going to be talking today now on fish, so switching from the corals, on some work that I've been doing for quite a few years looking at um, plastic capacity of coral reef fishes to ocean warming. So as we're all here for the same reason, we're concerned about environmental change for coral reefs. Um, and that's because we know that it's a relatively, expected to be a relatively rapid rate of change compared to the average conditions that species have evolved um, to live with. And generally for the tropical oceans, we're expecting that the sea um, water temperature will increase somewhere up to three degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And so I just wanted to quickly first summarize the range of traits that we know, and this is obviously not all of them, um, but the range of things that might be affected by elevated water temperature. So that we know that um, changes in temperature will affect the development rate and growth of fishes. We know it affects their physiological performance, um, their reproduction, their swimming ability, and even their sexual development. And generally, um, when we've tested um, tropical fishes, we find that increases expected with climate change will mean um, negative impacts on these traits and therefore fish and populations. So there's three particular traits that I've been interested in using um, in my research on plasticity. Um, firstly, reproduction, um, sexual development, and aerobic physiology. And the importance of reproduction is probably quite obvious. Um, it's a key determinant of fitness. Um, we want to know whether fish are reproducing, how often they're reproducing, what number of offspring they're producing, what's the quality. Um, we know that there's very strong potential for maternal effects in terms of the size of offspring they produce, how much yolk they give them, and what type of components are in those yolk resources. We also know that having the right balance of males and females in the population can be really important for um, the best population sustenance. Now, aerobic physiology may not be as intuitive to everyone, but it has been termed as a really important um, attribute for um, aquatic ectotherms in terms of how they're going to respond to environmental change and specifically temperature. So what we do know about aerobic physiology is that as temperature increases above the optimum, so does the resting um, oxygen consumption as a proxy for resting metabolic rate, um, which is believed to indicate the basic energy that's required to run the system for cell function. We also know that as temperature increases, the maximum metabolic rate increases, uh, maximum oxygen consumption, and this is the sort of maximum proxy of the maximum energy that's available for all those other activities, such as reproduction, swimming, and foraging. And the thing that uh, was defined as being really important is the difference between these two, the aerobic scope. And this can be presented as either um, the difference or the proportion, uh, proportional difference. So if I were to just summarize all the research that's generally been done when um, we go out and we collect fish from the reef and we either put them in tanks at the research facilities and we then um, increase the temperature to see how they perform, we find that most of them are living very close to their thermal optimum during summer. So when we apply any future temperature increases, we see that there's a decline in performance. But is this really an accurate prediction of how um, fishes and other species are going to perform in the future? And so the majority of my research focuses on the capacity for phenotypic plasticity or acclimation to environmental change. It is the capacity for alternative phenotypes, um, depending upon the environmental conditions, conditions experienced. Um, it is only non-genetic changes, but it will um, be determined by genotypes. We generally call it acclimation when the environment continues to change in a particular direction, so that's often in terms of climate change. But we know that there are limits to the plastic responses, what can be achieved within an individual's lifetime. And we know this because plasticity costs. It costs to sense the environment, to respond, and to produce phenotypic changes. There can be a cost if you respond incorrectly to those environmental cues, and there will be a time lag between when you receive the cue and you produce the phenotypic response. And this means that plasticity won't always occur. So it brings us to defining plasticity types and when we, when we expect them to actually occur. So the first is reversible plasticity. And this is within the lifetime of an organism. It doesn't have to be necessarily at any particular time in, in their life, um, but it's generally in response to daily or seasonal fluctuations. Developmental plasticity or developmental acclimation um, are permanent responses that occur due to a cue being received within early life. And transgenerational responses are parental effects that are passed from one generation to the next that are non-genetic in nature. <coughs> 
and to quickly cover most of the research that we know on tropical coral reef fishes they have very little capacity for reversible plasticity or acclimation because they've potentially evolved in such stable thermal environments there's not that much seasonal fluctuation so the rest of the talk is just going to be focusing on what we know about developmental and transgenerational acclimation so to start off all this research i picked a common damselfish the spiny chromis went out and collected a population from the central great barrier reef brought them back to the lab at jcu I then simulated the natural seasonal cycle of temperature treatments. So down on the bottom there, the green line indicates um, what was achieved in the AIMS loggers of the average temperature change. I then simulated a plus zero degrees control treatment, a plus 1.5 above that, and a plus three degrees Celsius. And the reason that I call the treatments that is because they're not an absolute temperature. They're seasonally cycling um, throughout the year. So to ask questions about developmental acclimation, I first started with um, breeding pairs. They then produced offspring that were divided between these three treatments, which means that I started off with similar genetic diversity and siblings between all these temperature treatments. So what I found. In terms of aerobic physiology, this is just the control response. This is what I said um, in the introduction, that as temperature increases, resting metabolic rate on the left increases, and aerobic scope on the right declines. The temperatures that I've put on the um, x-axis are just the average summer um, temperatures for the location of 28.5 and then plus 1.5 and plus 3 degrees above that. So what happens when fish develop for their entire life in these warmer conditions? Well, there's a little bit of capacity for developmental acclimation. We see a reduction in the resting metabolic rate at the warmest um, temperature treatment. So fish that develop in plus 3 degrees Celsius conditions for their entire life can reduce the cost of basic cell function but there's not really an improvement in aerobic scope. Next, moving on to reproduction. Um, I've just put in an orange line to indicate what the um, wild population does when it's placed under these warmer temperature conditions. And we use clutch size, so the number of eggs that are produced in a clutch, as well as the size of those eggs, because that's a good proxy for hatching size. Um, and they both decline as you increase temperature. But again, what happens when these um, fish are reared in these conditions for their entire lives? Well, we see a little bit of improvement in terms of clutch size at the plus 1.5, not much improvement in terms of egg area, but generally at plus 3 degrees Celsius, they're still um, producing a lot poorer in terms of the number and the size of eggs that they're reproducing. So that's um, exciting. The next step was really to take it to the, um, the next generation. So the fish that I've just showed you reach maturity, they produce offspring, and then I was interested in looking at what those offspring look like. This is the same graph as before in terms of physiology. Um, so we really only saw a slight improvement in terms of resting metabolic rate. When fish spend two generations at these warmer temperatures, we see the same response or similar response in terms of resting metabolic rate. But we see a complete um, restoration of aerobic scope. So in this case here, parents that have been reared in these warmer conditions are then passing on favorable traits to their offspring that were not possible just within one generation. So the capacity for transgenerational plasticity of physiology is a lot greater than the capacity for developmental plasticity. The next thing I wanted to do was to look in a little bit more detail about the importance of maybe the rate of warming across generations. So as we all know, it's not going to reach the end of the century tomorrow, um, and therefore maybe we might be, get some greater insight by having a treatment that's highlighted in the yellow that went to plus 1.5 for one generation and plus 3 degrees Celsius for the next. I was also interested in trying to break down the interaction between the effects of developing in a particular condition versus having to reproduce in that condition. And so therefore, I um, split most of the treatments here into all three of the, the temperature treatments, the plus zero, the plus 1.5, and the plus three. In the case of that step up treatment that went um, warmer across generations, I only um, managed to get that in the plus three. And unfortunately, I didn't have enough fish to do the full reciprocal crosses there for the plus three degrees Celsius for two generations, so I'm missing the middle guy. But I just wanted to highlight the importance of this sort of crossing and what it tells me. Well, first of all, since these fish have been in captivity for two generations, I thought it was really important to have a control within this generation for what the effect of reproducing at these warmer temperatures is. I also wanted to understand whether there's any benefits obtained from developing in these warmer conditions for two generations, but then being asked to reproduce at the warmest temperature of plus three degrees Celsius. I wanted to be able to compare that particular treatment to the one here, where in this case there was the opportunity for developmental acclimation at plus three degrees, 
plus three degrees Celsius on top of what the same parents oops, provided those offspring with um, in terms of transgenerational plasticity. And finally, I wanted to understand what the effects of being reared in these warmer temperature treatments were for multiple generations, but without the struggles and effects of having to actually reproduce at these warmer temperatures. And so when all the treatments went back to the plus zero degrees Celsius, this gave me that information. So basically, I'm just going to give this to you really slowly. Um, what you have here is uh, the month of breeding on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, you have the reproductive temperature. So as I said before, 28.5 is the sort of normal summer average temperature. 30 degrees is plus 1.5 higher, and 31.5 um, is the plus 3 degrees Celsius. So just to start off with the control fish, when they reproduce at normal conditions, they tend to reproduce from October to March, um, about 40% of the population reproduced. A really similar trend was achieved in this particular generation when they reproduced at plus 1.5, but you see a really stark difference when we get up to this plus 3 degrees Celsius, or 31.5 on average over summer, where only 10% of the population is reproducing, and they're only able to do it for that first month in October. But what about when you spend two generations at plus 1.5? The results are really similar, slight differences, but pretty much the same amount of reproduction happening um, in terms of the months and the proportion. And again, these fish were not able to reproduce um, more than the controls at the warmest temperature. So there wasn't really any evidence of benefits from developing at plus 1.5 for two generations, but having to reproduce at plus 3. Finally, in terms of reproducing um, at, or being developed at plus 3 degrees Celsius for two generations, um, it's very similar at the control conditions, but the strongest result was that we got no reproduction at the warmest temperature treatment. So while their parents had packaged them with good physiological traits, really wasn't any improvement in terms of the reproductive capacity. And finally, the step up treatment. This group that spent um, the first generation at plus 1.5 and the second generation at plus 3 um, were enhanced in terms of the months of the year that they were able to reproduce, as well as the proportion of the population that were actually reproducing, so 70%. <clears throat> so just giving the same metrics as before, um, clutch size and egg area, this is how the control group responded to these increases in temperature. So we see some declines in clutch size with increase in temperature, but in this generation the egg area was relatively maintained. When we look at what that two generation plus 1.5 treatment was doing, we see that they're able to have um, larger clutches at 30 degrees Celsius, so their new summer average temperature, but they're actually producing smaller eggs in both the 30 and the 31.5. So again, no real improvement for um, being reared at plus 1.5 in two generations, but having to reproduce at plus three. And finally, the plus three degrees Celsius treatment that then went back to um, control conditions uh, to reproduce. We see that they're producing quite similar clutch sizes and quite similar egg areas. And um, the step treatment that went 1.5 and then 3 in the next generation, not really that much improvement in terms of clutch size and still a decline in clutch area. But importantly, we know that there was many more of the um, individuals actually breeding in the population. So when we convert that just to the total number of eggs produced, we do see that there's actually some benefit compared to those that um, developed uh, control conditions for two generations or plus 1.5 degrees Celsius for two de generations. So the difference between that green and the yellow is the developmental acclimation on top of transgenerational acclimation. So another thing I was really interested in breaking down with my um, experiments is the fact of exposure timing. So a lot of times when we go out and we collect fish from the reef and we bring them back to the lab, we often um, collect breeding adults and we apply the environmental change to those adults. And then we ask, is there a transgenerational effect and can they improve their offspring? But obviously, when you get an environmental cue during your lifetime is going to be really important for then what sort of effect that will have on your offspring. So you also could receive a cue during early development, then grow to maturity and um, instead see what those different effects would be. And that's exactly what I did. So in this case, I wanted to show you the effects on gender to highlight the importance of timing. So if you're in a, a spiny chromis and you're in warmer water, you have a lot more chance of becoming a male. So there's direct effects of temperature on um, the sexual development that means that we go from the normal 50-50 sex ratio down to approximately 40 and 30% with these increases in temperature of plus 1.5 and 3 degrees Celsius. The exciting thing was that if you were reared at this, um, these warmer temperatures for one generation, when, then one, when you then produce offspring, 
those particular offspring at plus 1.5 degrees Celsius were restored back to the 50-50 sex ratio. So we're not 100% certain how this is happening, but it could be through gene expression, or it could be just that mothers are packaging their offspring with more estrogen, thus allowing feminization. At plus three degrees Celsius, we see this really large error bar, and that's largely because some parents are fixing the gender of their offspring, and other parents are still maintaining that really biased sex ratio. When we look at what happens when you spend two generations at these warmer temperatures, we see really similar results. Obviously, if you remember back to the reproductive um, treatments, we didn't have any reproduction at plus three degrees Celsius. But again, we see that even with two generations, our 50-50 balance of sex ratios is maintained. What about that step group, the one that got to have two generations, one at plus 1.5 and the next at plus three? Well, it turns out there's really no improvement in terms of the gender of their offspring. They're still maintaining this approximately 30% female ratio. But the key thing here is that what would happen if instead of needing a whole generation or two generations, I simply took those breeding pairs and put them in the warmer conditions and they were then allowed to produce offspring in those warmer conditions? Well, we don't see a restoration of the sex ratios. So this highlights that doing um, full simulations of full generations may be really important to trying to tease out what the true capacity for transgenerational plasticity will be. So obviously, just to summarise it all back together, um, there's obviously a lot more work to do. Um, acclimation across generations is definitely possible, but it seems to really depend on the trait of interest. And that suggests that we probably shouldn't really be focusing on one single trait as a as the only proxy. We know that physiology was restored very easily within two generations, but reproductive traits might be a lot slower, um, and especially there seems to be some limitations for transgenerational plasticity at plus three degrees Celsius. However, we do know that the rate of temperature increase is going to really influence these, this capacity for transgenerational plasticity and how um, developmental plasticity on top of transgenerational plasticity will start to come into play. And we definitely know that there's going to be some traits that just won't be fixed even um, with enough generations, probably at plus three degrees Celsius or some of these more extreme end of the century conditions. And obviously it took me a little while to do this, so I just want to say thank you to the funding that's come through over the years.